As mentioned, I'm a curator of contemporary art at the Rooms Provincial Art Gallery. Um, I was raised in New Brunswick in the arts community here, and uh, I firmly believe that it's because of this community that I have to this, have this career that I look at now and go, holy smokes, it's insane. And uh, it's, it's because there is opportunity here. There's an incredible support network. So I started... Um, standing outside the stairs of the Beaverbrook Art Gallery, scared to go inside, and uh, being invited in um, by someone at the front door, eventually working at the front desk, then sweeping floors at uh, Gallery Connection, working at the uh, City Hall Art Gallery, um, started working at Struts and Sackville, all the way up to uh, the Confed Center and PEI, to the rooms now. And uh, the community, so it's, it's wonderful to be back here. It's wonderful to be back here with people that I, I, I know and the, the community that I love. Um, I just came from the Toronto Art Fair, which is why I have a bit of a cold, because it's such, a, such an intense event that it's good to be back with people that are... It's a revitalizing thing. Now, I call this talk, Wish You Were Here, uh, not because I want you all to move to Newfoundland, although it is a really wonderful place to be, and actually I would love to steal you all and bring you there, um, because uh, it's... This idea that I've noticed uh, traveling across Canada and talking to other communities as well, this, this central idea that we all feel that we're uh, looking at other people. So I have this uh, Alex Colville image to, to speak to that, that we're always comparing ourselves to others. In Regina, for instance, I was asked, why do you guys always get the shows at the, you know, the National Gallery of Canada? Why is Atlantic Art such a big, so, so much celebrated? Why can't we get in? Um, and, and then I go to other communities and they go, well, you know, we're having a really tough time. We can't, we can't be seen. And I'm not trying to push that aside because certainly there are geographical and logistical aspects uh, to living in places where you can't have access or it's dif excuse me, difficult to get access to curators, to writers, and so on. But I'm just going to speak about my experience with the Newfoundland community, which um, is a really vibrant and wonderful place. Uh, it has about 1,500 artists, uh, 250 in St. John's, which is 3.3% of the population. That's four times the national average. And uh, they're, they're a good crowd. So my idea, my role as a curator is to tell stories within the gallery space. And I do that through the artworks, I do that through texts, um, but I, I pull from conversations with artists to, to, have, to make people feel comfortable in the space um, having a conversation with that art. Now, Newfoundland. This is, uh, the, the, this is from the tourist uh, ads for Newfoundland that you've all seen, of course. Uh, when you're always a half hour ahead, you've, you never feel the need to catch up. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> um, I was t actually talking, I, I was talking to Christopher Pratt uh, yesterday, and I said, hey, Christopher, can you, do you have any advice uh, for the New, the New Brunswick people? He goes, well, I don't really want to. Uh, I don't want to say anything. I, I mean, in Newfoundland, um, we benefit from having this really positive idea of isolation. Um, very much so, and uh, certainly artists like Christopher Pratt and Mary Pratt and uh, Gerald Squires have benefited from that, but he says there's so many fine people in New Brunswick, I don't want to tell them what to do. I was like, okay, okay then, fine. Thanks, Christopher, for nothing. <laughs> but So we are in a different time zone. We joined Canada in 1949, and... Um, uh, there's a very strong identity in Newfoundland, very strong sense of identity. So for instance, when I, when I tell people that I'm going to the mainland, I often jokingly say that I'm going back to Canada uh, because they, uh, we identify, or they identify themselves as um, Newfoundlanders first. And I've only been there for five years. I don't pretend to be an expert on a Newfoundland culture, but it has been a really uh, invigorating experience. So th this is what Newfoundland actually looks like most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> this is the view from my office window. Uh, so I, I, I'm interested in ideas, uh, the, the romanticism that is laid upon Newfoundland, ideas of what it means to be a Newfoundlander and how the, those stories are told to the world. You'll see that take, run through various projects that I'll, I'll, I'll be talking about. I'll quickly run through some, some major projects that I've done and then I'll talk about Folklore and Other Panics, which is my baby, which came from about four years of questioning and talking to artists and just seeing what, asking what does it mean to make art here. 
So th this is my, my uh, home most of the day. This is the rooms. It's an archives, museum, and art gallery. It was built about 10 years ago, and it's a, it's a strange family. Uh, the museum is very much based in this uh, very objective, historical uh, approach. Of course, the archives, that's where you go to learn about your, your, your personal family history. But the art gallery, we view ourselves as uh, the bad brother, the bad younger brother, because it is our job to question. It is our job to take contemporary and historical culture, which is contemporary in its own right, and reframe it. And it's fun. So this is at the top of Signal Hill. Um, it's, I love it. It's a map of, of course, the world that has taken Newfoundland as the center. And I love that shift in perspective. Why not? Why not view the world as if Newfoundland was at the very center? Because we talk about the idea of, of you know, outside and center, but I, I don't think it's that simple. I think that there are many centers that are interacting with each other, very much so. And I, I, you know, I look at New York City, it's, uh, I think, one of the most insular communities out there, to be honest. And uh, I think that um, the, the art world itself is continuously seeking and looking out to, uh, to draw in its own inspiration. Um, and, and so every, every place is a center. Every place is measuring itself. But what if you start from here? So, a wonderful, wonderful thing about Newfoundland, too, is that there's a little bit of chutzpah. There's chutzpah. Uh, so, uh, I was in a bar uh, that the uh, Duke of Duckworth, which you probably know from Republic of Doyle, sitting around with some friends, and we said, listen, like, wh why can't we get to the Venice Biennale? It's, it, we'll, we'll probably never get in. We had, um, you know, through the tr more traditional channels of the Canadian Pavilion and so on, and so we said, well, uh, why don't we just try? So uh, we did, and um, it was insane. Uh, we, uh, we drew, this was, an, it was a, an amazing event. We drew on multiple funding resources, everything from uh, Kickstarter uh, to the local, to municipal funding, to uh, provincial funding. We didn't have Canada Council this time around. And uh, we had fundraisers at the East, at Eastern Edge, our artist-run center. We had uh, a lot of like pr uh, private donors as well. The community really came together to see Newfoundland sent to the Venice Biennale. And for those who don't know, the Venice Biennale is one of the oldest um, and largest uh, arts. Uh, it's like a fever dream, essentially. But the art world comes to Newfoundland, comes to Venice. And so we thought, well, let's bring uh, Newfoundland to them. Um, so uh, this is Will Gill. He's, a, he's a, one of the two artists that we exhibited. I was, the, I was the chair of the board for this particular iteration and ended up being one of the, uh, the co-curators as well. This is uh, his work here. So, I mean, there's, there's, we were just we're saying, listen, we make contemporary good work here. So we applied, and in fact, uh, Peter Wilkins, who is this artist here, ran across, went to Venice, ran across the piazza after the guy who ran the, Ven the Venice Biennale, put the application in his hand, and uh, we found out uh, about a month later that we had been accepted as a collateral project. So effe effectively what that meant was uh, we were in the catalog, uh, we were at all of our marketing materials were at the Central Pavilion, and uh, we, were, we, had, we were there. You know, we were there. So... <laughs> it was crazy. Uh, so this is another work by Peter Wilkins. Uh, this is uh, the essay that was in the, the, the main catalog for the Biennale. This was our, our gallery, this uh, Gothic Palazzo, right on, uh, so there's no car, there are no cars in Venice, which is a, it's a very um, um, interesting soundscape to be a part of. Um, but this is where we showed, we were right off the water taxi there. And uh, here's uh, Peter Wilkins uh, pointing to the map of where we were located. So... And this is us, so Venice floods every year, essentially. This is Aqua Alta, is what this is called. And uh, <laughs> so you can see Will Gill's crate up there. It says, keep dry. <laughs> and then, uh, then, then ours are, there's another board member here standing in a puddle. So uh, this was the show itself. Um, the art world came to us. 
So we had 30,000 people there. Um, everyone from curators from the Louvre, uh, from uh, the National Gallery of Canada, all across Canada. The thing about the Canadian art world is that it's so big that everyone goes to places to see each other, and the Venice Biennale is one of those. So this was, uh, we had articles in Vie des Arts. This is uh, me speaking to uh, uh, the woman from Vie des Arts, Michelle. And this is the, the, the couch that I scrubbed for an hour to make it look presentable. And uh, this is uh, Leah Sandals from Canadian Art Magazine talking with uh, Peter Wilkins. This is uh, John Fox, who was the Canadian ambassador to um, Italy, who came, uh, came in and he's like, the first thing he said was, oh, how come you guys don't speak in funny accents? <laughs> and uh, so, so Peter is a very posh British fellow. He's lived in Newfoundland for 15 years, and I think we surprised him. But he was very, very supportive afterwards. And uh, this was our opening. Um, a, a, it was just, it was insane. I was, I was lighting my cigarette outside and this, the, the editor from Vogue magazine came over and lit it for me. And isn't that crazy? <laughs> so uh, anyways, it was, it was mind blowing. Um, and this is another view from inside the gallery at the opening. And then, uh, so two years later, we said, okay, well, let's go again, because we wanted, we, wanted, we see this as a long-term turnover art foundation, we see it as a long-term investment of, of bringing Newfoundland artists to an international venue, and we want, want to expand to, to other uh, places as well. Um, we're looking at Miami next, if possible. So we went again. <laughs> this time we were funded by the Canada Council, um, very much so, it was wonderful. We had artist Jordan Bennett here, and Anne Troke, and uh, the show was curated by Chris Clark, who was a Newfoundland-born curator who's now based in Ireland. So uh, I wasn't there, unfortunately. I was installing a show at the rooms, but uh, it, was, uh, it was really well attended. So there they are, being wonderful and happy, and uh, we're all like, it's, it's amazing. And I love those shoes. Like, I just want to steal Jordan's shoes. Some other um, aspects of my job, so back at home. Uh, uh, we have, the Newfoundland arts community is very young. It's only been around since really the 1960s. But it's benefited in that time from a very strong community. And so artists like Mary Pratt, who of course is from New Brunswick, from Fredericton, New Brunswick, uh, built her career there and in turn helped to build uh, the community as well. So the rooms, for instance, is very much um, her doing. She was very much a part of that. So Mary Pratt, uh, I had the great pleasure of working with her. And uh, we had a national tour that went to those venues there. This, these are images from the show itself. So this was her first solo exhibition since 2005. And we wanted to show that she is a very, she's, con she's still relevant. That these, the, these artists that might be perceived as being older or um, lacking relevance in, in a larger contemporary scene, where that's, that's BS, um, she's still very present. So we, we switched, based on conversations with her, I, I, I realized that she views her day as a, <clears throat> a series of tasks or a, a rituals. As she goes through, like she cuts her pear or her apple in the morning, she'll paint for a certain period of time, and then uh, there, there's just her day is measured. So I wanted to, myself and my two fellow curators wanted to reflect that, um, and we also uh, wanted to talk about her work in a more thematic sense rather than a chronological sense. So this is, you can see this, the sections here. And uh, this was a salon hang wall that we did um, to talk about the fact that she's still relevant historically, but that she's dealing with really contemporary subject matter, um, saran wrap and uh, just all that kind of goodness, chickens on a Coca-Cola box. And um, anyways, I'm really proud of that show. <laughs> so I um, toured nationally and we did a book with Goose Lane, which has, uh, you know, I'm very proud of as well. It's a beautiful book, but it was, it was important uh, for us to, for the rooms and for myself and for the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia to, to share the art that was happening here. So it was a very successful tour. We had about 140,000 people go through and the, the book is sold out I think twice over and it's going into reprint. And um, it, it's, for me it's kind of like, yeah! <laughs> you know, because uh, I think a lot of people uh, view what's happening in the Atlantic provinces as being uh, a little bit old school. And I hate that. I am, I, I am like fists out, 
always fighting uh, for the Atlantic provinces and for the arts communities that exist here. Uh, I was on the Sobe Art Award uh, two years ago and it was very important for me to reframe the idea of what it means to be contemporary. Because I think, as I, as I talk about you know, the differences uh, between centers and outsides, that there are actually a whole bunch of different centers, there are also different times happening. So Newfoundland, I mean, literally exists in another time zone, a half hour time zone all to its own. But there's also a different language that has developed there um, that needs to be recognized and needs to be celebrated. And although it might be perceived to be old, it is not. It is still living and uh, valuable. Uh, so um, I also, I benefit a lot from chance and conversation. I was in the library at the, the rooms and Tom Smart was there um, while the Mary Pratt show was up. And he said uh, to me, you know, you should really try to get this show to the National Gallery of Canada. They, they need it. And so I said, okay, <laughs> let's do this. Um, because I, I do also think it's important just to go ahead and do it, so I, but nicely. So I sent an email. <laughs> I sent a, I sent an email to my to my colleague Jonathan Shaughnessy, who is the uh, associate curator of uh, contemporary art at the National Gallery of Canada, and I said, uh, Jonathan, uh, is it how would one go about proposing a show to the NGC? And uh, he said, Oh, uh, you know, you do this, you do this, you do this, you talk to Christine Sadler, blah, blah, blah. And so I sent her a really nice email. I uh, took out my credit card and I went to Ottawa. I didn't have a director at the time, we were between directors. So I was like, Let's do this. I paid my way to Ottawa, I had coffee with them, and uh, we talked about how important the show was. I spent an entire day going through their exhibition records just to see. Um, if, you know, if they had, ha what was their record of showing Atlantic female artists and what was their record of showing Atlantic artists, period. Um, in both cases, it was too, admittedly paltry. I think it was about 2% uh, for Atlantic artists and for women, it was 0, 0.0. So I, I presented that to them and, they, and Jonathan, who is a wonderful advocate for the arts in the Atlantic provinces, uh, presented this show uh, to his exhibitions committee. So. It happened, and this was the first uh, solo exhibition of a female Atlantic artist in Canadian history. It was the... Uh, <laughs> Thanks. And it was crazy. Uh, so this, this is the outside banner, and uh, above all, it was just, it was important uh, for me uh, to have, give that to Mary to be honest, that, that's what it was. It was to, to give it to Mary because uh, she deserved it. Um, and, and so here she is uh, at the opening on the left uh, giving this absolutely beautiful speech um, about uh, this being the cherry on top of her, her career that her mother would make dessert and would always put a cherry on the top and how much she loved that um, and how this was for her the cherry. Uh, and then on the right is a, a Q&A um, conversation between myself, Jonathan, and Mary, extremely well attended. Again, again, guys, 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 Atlantic art, it's, it's wonderful. It's, uh, I think it, it, the public responds um, in droves to, the, the, to what we do here, very much so. Alex Colville was one of the most well attended shows at the AGO, Christopher Pratt across the board, Mary Pratt, and that's just a small portion of it. Uh, so again, I'm like, guys, it's good. So uh, I also had the, the opportunity to work with Christopher Pratt as well on, on his exhibition, The Place I, Places I Go. And uh, this was based on four years of conversation as well, sitting on the couch, being in his studio, being like, why do you do what you do? And um, what is this? And uh, his, his extreme patience with my, my questions. And um, so this is a 10-year retrospective that we did. Now, the thing about Christopher Pratt and I bring this back to the central theme, is that he's made his career in isolation. He describes it as being made in isolation, that he's devoted his life to Newfoundland. Um, the, I, I wanted to do something different with him, too. I wanted to uh, make his work seem a little less cold, because I think a lot of people think that his work is cold. I know I did. In fact, the first time I went up to him, I, I just said to him, I was like, oh, I'm, like I'm scared of you. <laughs> 
And uh, that's actually what I said. And he, he ran away. I think he was scared of me. Um, but then, because <laughs> like, who is this? Uh, but this is, this is based on, he surrounds himself with these objects that he collects as he travels Newfoundland, and he's dedicated his life to traveling Newfoundland. He goes on the road, he writes in his books all his thoughts about the weather, about what he ate at Tim Hortons, um, about his memories of a place, and uh, those inform the paintings. And in fact, those paintings that might appear quite cold are actually just layered with memories and layered with experience and are incredibly warm. Uh, but there, he has a respect for the medium, and that, that's what that is, that's, it, it's a painting for him. So we made a film uh, just having moments traveling across Newfoundland and we also, I also stole objects from his studio and we had uh, interviews with him so it was as if he were sitting with him having a conversation which is what I wanted. And then he has these boards of images of people that uh, he went to school with, of places he, he's been um, that are just lovely. So I, I put those in as well. Um, so here's a few shots of that show. This is the past 10 years, as I've, as I've said. So this is Argentia. This is a base um, in Newfoundland where he worked for a little while. And uh, it's such a strange part of his uh, career that he paints this. Um, but it's also the most... I, I'll, okay, I'll try not to be cu too curatorial. Actually, I'll try to stay away from <laughs> doing a tour of the show. But this is the last one he's going to paint um, of that series. It's, it's the last large-scale painting that he's going to do. And it's a really compelling series. And uh, so I strongly recommend that you purchase the book from Goose Lane Editions <laughs> and read about it. Um, so I'm not only focused uh, in my career, and we're not only focused at the gallery on promoting the, the more senior artists, we also work with the, the emerging artists. Um, with there's, there's a whole bunch of them that have come back uh, from studies and now inform uh, the community there. It's a vibrant, wonderful thing. Uh, so we have a series called the Elbow Room Residency Series where they stay at the rooms for three months and make a new body of work. And it has, it's been very successful. This is just a part of the studio. This is Matthew Hollett working in uh, the space. But you can see on the floor evidence of just messy, messy creatures that I have had to clean up. Um, John um, McDonald painted a, 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 s a version of his story from uh, uh, the ceiling disaster of 1914. Uh, his, his uncle and his, uh, his great-great-grandfather and his great-great-uncle were, uh, were a part of that. So he put himself and his brother in that scenario and made these beautiful paintings, uh, which are now uh, on permanent display at the Elliston Sealers Memorial which is gorgeous. And there's a, there's a Kleenex box there, too, which is, I think, beautiful, because people just cry in front of them. This is Philippa Jones. Uh, she made a false museum space, which was fantastic. You can see there's a hornet's nest there, which has writing in it. Uh, she's all about this, this... We went out into the woods, and I pretended to be an archaeologist, and she pretended to be a psychic, and other people pretended to be shamans, and we pretended to be experts. And then we made a false story about this magical island, and then she documented it and made it into a scientific uh, presentation. And her work, she made this 14-foot drawing that gave her carpal tunnel, tunnel syndrome. Um, it was acquired by the National Gallery of Canada. Um, so she was one of the first among two other artists that were shown as part of their contemporary uh, biennial and here she is talking about it. This is Kyle Buston. Um, he made these masks. He's a graffiti artist. He's now uh, doing his MFA in Ottawa. This is Audrey Hurd. These are hug pillars. So uh, it's all about the, you know, how some people you, you are in a relationship with, they might seem really uh, squishy and awful and everywhere all, all, you know, at first, and then they become stiff and hard. Um, or they have layers of history that become dirty and greasy <laughs> over time. Or they're soft and they take you in and then they forget you. And so that's what she was talking about here. <laughs> and here we are making that cement pillar. It was a, quite an event, but it was really quite beautiful I, at one point. She was just there hugging this thing for 15 minutes. Her glasses all uh, fogged up. And uh, it, was, it was really quite beautiful. And that show was very successful, too. A lot of people, it just got dirty. So many people <laughs> hugged it. And uh, this is uh, the memory foam here. 
This is her hugging. So this is her hug. So you're hugging her. I love it. And uh, this is a, a gift from our current, or our text he just finished, Matthew Hollett. Um, he made an interactive simulation of uh, large-scale suburban-style houses falling into, the, falling into the ocean. And the numbers increase according to how many people are in front of it. Um, so, But now to the, to the main um, struggle for me, I suppose. It was, this was, I just, I struggled over this show. This is a Folklore and Other Panics. <clears throat> it's a 12-person exhibition uh, asking what it means to make art in Newfoundland. And, and so I wanted, to, I wanted to talk about this long tradition of folklore in Newfoundland, which is much older than, than any of the visual arts. And I, I wanted to say, I wanted to see if, if this tradition could inform contemporary art, which seems to always be looking for the new. And I, I wanted to also play with the idea that folk culture is often considered backward looking. Um, that, so the idea of a panic being that um, it might be considered a negative thing to be dealing with folk art or to be dealing with folk, folk culture. Um, but then I did some research and uh, realized that um, when people, according to studies, in panic situations, people will actually come together. They won't do what they see you see in the movies. They'll uh, come together and they'll help each other. Um, so I wanted to, I had this, I read this really fascinating quote by this fellow called John Komaroff, where he says, uh, folklore, let me tell you, is one of the most dangerous words in the English language. I liked that. I, saw, I thought, well, you know, contemporary art is so interested in risk and urgency. Well, how, you know, how could folklore be that, and he says later, the point becomes not to study difference, but rather to decenter ourselves by asking what it is that context reveals of our taken for granted, our commonsensical axioms about the nature of the world. So this, this show was all about authority too. It was all about questioning authority. It was all about folk culture as questioning authority as well. Um, so I'll just get into it. This is the entrance. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna take this out. Um, over here, you can see Kay Burns. Uh, her work is currently at the Beaver Art Gallery. It's, it's the Museum of the, the Flat Earth. Uh, two works from that, a Michael Flaherty piece and then a Mark Klintberg piece. Uh, so, so you walk in and instantly you're, you're hit with this, uh, this idea, of, which is based on the idea of common sense, um, of the world as being flat. And why not? You know, you look around and you see, you look out, it's, it looks flat. So why are you going to listen to what other people are, are telling you that the world is round? Like, that's just nonsense. Maybe you should believe in yourself. Maybe you should. <laughs> so anyways, uh, um, we had an opening ceremony where we stomped globes and we renounced globularism. And uh, th so this is a part of a larger project that Iris Taylor, uh, sorry, Kay Burns has done. Um, oops. As a pseudonym, as this uh, alter ego, Iris Taylor. Uh, she's based in Fogo Island, which is one of the, the, the corners of the flat earth. She's responsible for this sign here, warning you are nearing the edge of the flat earth. One false step could be your last. Number of people lost to date, zero. <laughs> and she's, uh, she's accumulated all this research based, of course, in uh, the society that was at UNB in the 1970s and had people like Alden Nolan um, as, as part of it. So she, she tells a story of Bartholomew Seeker who came to Fogo and then mysteriously disappeared but did a lot of research there and she is, is researching what he did there as well. So this is one of the flat earths. <clears throat> this is Bartholomew Seeker's earth up here. So he didn't exist either, just so you know. But it's, it's kind of, it's, she's playing with that idea of false history. Um, so the title, while you look off into the left, and there's a radio booth there. And this is a, a work done by Mike, Michael Waterman. It's, uh, you go in, it's broadcasting live, it was broadcasting live uh, across the internet, but you could also carry it around on an FM radio. And uh, the whole point was to disrupt and take over. So you could take whatever uh, albums, eight tracks, uh, cassettes, whatever you wanted, and play it. You could. We had school groups coming in. We had uh, marriage proposals. We had uh, people just going hello, hello, and uh, <laughs> and then we had me coming in and reading whatever weird art news was out there. 
um, that it was a really uh, effective and a really interesting part of the show. The whole idea being that it was a pirate radio. And so pirate radios are when you take a transmitter and you broadcast, you broadcast whatever you want to broadcast. And this is part of his practice that he's been, uh, been doing for a long time. Um, so again, this kind of like um, Wizard of Oz room uh, where you could control the message that was being relayed around the show and also uh, just say whatever you want. And this is the space proper. This is the outside space. You can see Janice Wright Cheney's Koi Wolves, Jerry Robson's large-scale wall drawing. <clears throat> to the back, uh, Dwayne Linklater. Um, and I'll talk about these works quickly as well. Steve Topping, this table. It's amazing. And then uh, some wallpaper that was made for the Fogo Island Inn uh, by Kim Greeley and uh, Erica Jane Stevens-Moore. So the koi wolves, I wanted to talk about uh, ideas of nature and how nature informs our perception of the world, the stories that we say. Um, the, wolf, the wolf was hunted to extinction in Newfoundland in, uh, by 1930, but the koi wolf has come back, and it's a hybrid of the coyote and the wolf. But the thing about the, this new being or new beast is that it, it thrives where humans thrive, um, as opposed to the wolf, which is a bit shyer and which... Um, uh, which, which can't survive um, with human population or hasn't been able to because we've hunted it too. But the koi wolf survives and thrives. Um, to, the, to the, I'll come to that actually eventually. So, so she's, she's, Janice Wright Cheney has made these beautiful beings that were meant to be a threat in the gallery space. Um, they were meant to be an interloper. And they're there in disguise as little old ladies. Uh, here is a, one other thing is that I, I wanted to talk about art as being largely informal because, you know, although I do work in a gallery space, I believe that art happens outside of it, that you can look at an artwork and it will change how you will walk home. I firmly believe that. Um, and that how art is created is through sites of gathering. So I had two places where people could gather. There, there was, a, this is um, Lee Henderson. Um, his work is the, the known effects of lightning on the body. There's a lit match that, there's a thousand lit, lit matches that are lit and then just die. And there's this constant uh, electric light up above. And so it mimics a campfire, but it's also for him talking about ideas of trauma. Um, it's, it's also, it's, for him it was a very cathartic experience, but here it became more about gathering. Um, so you would come in and you'd see people there a lot. And uh, in the back, you can see Dwayne Linklater. Dwayne Linklater uh, went to Cape Spear uh, to see the sunrise. And he, he updated Wikipedia to say at 2.45, oh, what was it? Oh, shoot. I think it was 5 something in the morning. It was when the sun rose. Oh, I should know that. Anyways, he, he updated Wikipedia to say that he was there. And it was quickly deleted. And uh, then he put it back, and it was deleted again, and he put it back, and it was deleted again. And then over a course of several years, people are putting it back for him. But there's also this major, uh, very interesting conversation that's happening on the side pages where people are saying, well, you know, who is this guy, and why is he updating things? But it's about authority, and it's about uh, returning a subject, subjective experience to one that is intended to be open to the public. And uh, it's fascinating, and I, 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 love, I love how he proceeds through the world because he takes a very simple act and makes it political and multifaceted. Uh, so the, the wall, on the wall is the record of the conversations of edits. And then there's a film looking out uh, to, to Cape Spear, or from Cape Spear. And it's very, very beautiful because it, it takes about 10 minutes for the sun to rise, very, very slow, it's almost imperceptible. But that's what he was doing there, he was just, he just wanted to film it, and he thought, well, maybe I'll just update Wikipedia. Um, <clears throat> the caribou are, are very much a part of Newfoundland culture. Uh, and during the First World War, we lost uh, a, a large amount of, of people at uh, Beaumont Hamill. The anniversary is coming up of that, the 100th anniversary, and um, that their symbol was the caribou. Um, but also caribou have been brought into various parts of Newfoundland for, for game and for, uh, well, they're, they've, they've been brought out. They're everywhere now, so you walk around and you see them. But uh, these artists made, Kim Greeley 
and Erica Jane Stevens Moore made this wallpaper uh, to go in the Fogo Island Inn, which I, if you have any questions about that, I can talk to you about that later, but it's, a, it's basically, I'm sure you've heard of it. Have you heard of it? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> so they, they wanted to, I wanted to talk about the fact that folklore is in the walls, that it's in the furniture, that it's everywhere, that it can, it can, it can be wallpaper. And so I put these in the center of the, the art gallery to talk about that. Um, so here they have these lovely, lovely caribou. Let's see. Passion Over Reason uh, was made by Mark Klimtberg at Fogo Island as well. And he worked with 12, 12 women from the Wind and Waves Artisans Guild, uh, drawing on that knowledge there. He didn't know how to quilt. He learned how to quilt. And uh, so Fogo Island uh, works with local quilters to make these, these quilts that are put on the bed um, sold for a good price. And that's, that's, their, that's their intention. So he made a, a series of, I think, about 12 of them. It's pulling from um, Joyce Whelan's work, Reason Over Passion, which was a, a phrase that was uh, put out by Just, uh, not Justin Trudeau. Oh, my God. <laughs> Pierre Elliott Trudeau, uh, that he said, you know, I operate reason over passion. And uh, Margaret Trudeau famously ripped the letters from the quilt, saying, why can't you put passion before reason just this time? And so he was interested in that. He was interested in the uh, interventions of women um, in a political landscape, and he was also interested in just flipping the, the terms to see what would happen. So in the gallery space, it became a political slogan. It was, it was also me... Uh, wanting to talk about the idea of, well, yeah, well, let's pull away from this, this idea of, of uh, intellectualizing art, just for, just, just to see what happens. Uh, so he, this is a, a, this was, so he made this with the people, their names are behind it. And um, it's a, a very, it's a traditional Fogo Island based quilt, it's called a quilted, quilted, quilt in a day, I think it is. And it's a strip, strip quilts, strip lines. I'm sure you guys know more about it than I do. I'm useless, just so you know. I can't make anything. I can't cook. I can't, uh, I just hang out. <laughs> uh, so this is Michael Flaherty. Uh, he, he, he read a book by John Steffler called The Grey Islands. So he went to the Grey Islands, which is way up in the north of Newfoundland. And um, he, he stayed there for three months in this romantic isolation, making an inside-out kiln just to be absolutely absurd, just to do it. But he noticed that uh, although the people had left because of resettlement, the caribou were quite prevalent. They had taken over, it was their island. So he made these ceram he's a ceramic fundamentalist. He believes that ceramics are what made modern, modern art happen. Um, and uh, he made these uh, ceramic um, antler and he drew on it the first, uh, the oldest house on, Fogo, uh, on the Grey Islands, and uh, has this, the shards, the remnants of the people who were there previously as well. Now this beast, um, I found out that uh, uh, before my time, that the, the artists of my generation and just before would get together in this old fishing stage, this decrepit, decrepit old building on the uh, outskirts of the Battery. And uh, they would get together, this is everyone from Sherry Boyle to like local Joe, and get drunk and play poker and draw each other, draw each other on the table. There's still these layers and layers of, of really high caliber artists and, and average people <laughs> drawing uh, aliens with middle fingers. And in fact, that's John McDonald, the painter that you saw earlier, who did that. Uh, and I was, I was just interested in uh, the idea that um, they, don't, they didn't talk about art. They just drew, they hung out. It was an informal space. And the, the other aspect of this, uh, this is the stage right there. It's, a, it's repurposed now. It used to be, of course, used for, for fishing. Um, but because of the cod moratorium, its, its use has now changed, and it's become now a form of artistic center. It looks really rank there um, because it was it was broken into over the summer by some by like birds and kids, and so I had to go in there with a mask on to get this table out. Um, but the other interesting thing about the table was that it uh, we pulled it out of the space, and then we had we used white gloves. Um, uh, to, to bring it into the, the gallery, and then the uh, conservator fixed it up and did all her stuff, all this professional goodness, and uh, then uh, then we brought it back, and I was playing poker on it two weeks later, and uh, like spilling beer on it. 
So, <laughs> so it, it became a, a, an art object in the space, but it, you know, it, it wasn't. So it's kind of nice playing with those labels. So uh, here it is in the space. Behind it, oh, and we had poker games there in the space. We had per singing performances. The whole point was that the space was intended to be continually activated, continually having weird things happen in it. Settlers of Catan, we played. Um, it was just, it was, it was, it wasn't a dead space. That was the intention. So uh, the the wall that you see behind that table is Jerry Robson. He's a professor at Mount A. He's also a Newfoundlander. Uh, he made this 40 foot long wall drawing. Um, he's interested in alternative spaces. He's interested, interested in um, the rec rooms, the conversations that happen in sheds, the informal as well. So he, he drew um, his home uh, in the back. And then he, when he was on Fogo Island as a residence, in residence as well, he, re he learned that people would put up flagpoles to to call others to either help move a house or, or whatever. And uh, so he, he built one on, Fo on Fogo Island, but he built one in the space as well. It was, you know, the community is so spread out that you have to put, you put up a signal and people will come together. And so he was there for the first week um, creating this thing. And uh, the, these lists um, are what people said as they came into the gallery or things he remembered. Just this, this, the, the, the things that surrounded him. So there's really wonderful stuff. Like you can see the waves or trying to, oh, I can't even read it. People are some nice to ye. Uh, will it ever be documented? That Mrs. likes the art. <laughs> and it was great. So I, I guess in summation or end, uh, I believe very strongly, as I've said, that art takes place in the informal, that it takes place in gatherings and in conversation and in asking questions and in being open to questions. Um, I believe, uh, you know, despite there's this kind of overarching idea that the grass is greener on the other side, that in fact uh, the grass is green where you water it. Thank you. Okay.